going to leave there. So you need to think about that a little bit. I'm not saying it can't be done. People have been doing it with, with mouth mouth and hailing for a long time. Where I think the magic of this is, is finding a way to introduce livestock back to the system. In that case, harvest it with the livestock on the farm rather than figuring out swath it, bail it, pack it up, truck it down the road. So in fact, more efficient. Swath and bail it or hold the cows back. And that's the question you got to ask. Kim, what are you sitting out here? Me? Yeah, you. That's you. Give me that quote today. We were talking about this, about good old Eric Jackson over at Kim, about the bales, about he figured out how many how many dollars worth of nutrients was in the bale that he was hauling to his field and what the bale cost. What was those numbers again? No, no, it, it was like, at that time, 55 bucks a bale. 55, 55 bucks a ton. And he said, you know, I can... I can haul it out there and get the cattle fed and get the nutrients for 70. And he said, you know, I think that's pretty good. But do we want to talk about what else? Might be, I guess the point I was trying to make there, we're flipping this thing around here a little bit. He figured out the bales were basically costing him almost nothing because of the nutrients he was getting here. And your equation is the opposite of that. I mean, we're packing them up and we're hauling somewhere else. And so the only way we're going to replace those is go to town, got some more of those more on inputs, and go back out there and get that ground floor line and start over again. So anyway, it's a point of fodder. Uh, do you want to finish your point, Ken? Well, I, I mean, his was a range land outfit. <clears throat> and I think, and we're having a tour there next this summer, by the way. He is a really, I mean, he's probably one of the three best grazing managers I've ever known. His soils were ready to take those nutrients in. I think a lot of people will haul the alfalfa out there and they get the cows fed. But they're not getting the nutrients because the soils aren't ready to take them in. I see your concept. I just want to know. Ed? I was just, my comment was similar to Tim, but the nutrient cycling, Tim talked about the nutrient cycling. You've got to have that in place before you can use those residues. And, and be able to gather those that fifty-five dollars worth of nutrients out of them. So, and and a lot of our rain soils here really aren't doing a good job of nutrient cycling. Very good. One last point on Don's comment. And this goes for the whole thinking about this thing. As long as you think about what you're doing before you do it, and you understand the ramifications. You do whatever you think you need to do to survive. It's at least something you might look at differently now once you think about what's really going on in that system. Even like Tim's example, he's talking about how much top soil he hauled off just in the grain alone. But now, what you're talking about doing is taking the grain and the whole plant and lugging it off. So it's, it's actually accelerating that, that nutrient cycling in the wrong direction. We can increase. Diversity of vegetation. Most people are perfectly comfortable with seeing what's going on on our, our rangelands. We expect diversity of vegetation out there. But in our crop plants, we're doing basically just the opposite. We're focusing on single seed. That's what we want to do because we're trying to grow the things we want to grow. So how do we get diversity of vegetation? I know we talked about crop rotations earlier. Bob mentioned cover crops. By the way, has anybody in here seeded or planted or grown a cover crop before? Show of hands. Oh yeah, Daskin has. You have? Okay. So this is not completely, completely alien talk. We're going to show you some neat things here in a little bit. But essentially, these are the items why, why this makes a lot of sense. We read a conference call this morning briefly, a gentleman called who presented to us in Burlington. He was talking about the studies he'd done up in Akron, he did in Akron for ARS. And essentially, it was kind of neat, and this is some things you guys can just think about this as we go a little deeper into this cover crop thing. For every 1,000 pounds of residue on the soil surface, they observed a 10 bushel increase in their corn yields on the following crop. And they, the one example was 2,000 pounds of residue over here versus 5,000 pounds over here. There was a 30 bushel increase in the corn yields. And they saw this more than once. It wasn't an aberration. He goes, man, there's something to this. I ran this by my feed guy later on this afternoon before I came over today. He goes, oh, absolutely. He goes, I've seen it too many times. He goes, you've got to have that residue out there. And that'll drive the system. So there's some neat things that happen here. Take home message here, though, all greater than some of the parts. That's essentially what you saw in that picture where I'm busting out of that cocktail mix there. That thing, collaborative with all those plants working together in synergy, produced way more biomass than those species, any one of them did individually over 
over there and we'll side by side plot there and blame Maybe Danny Grange. Now Tim tells me, and I have no reason to doubt him because so far he's been a pretty straight shooter. He said this is over just to the edge of Kansas. Do you think it's by Johnson or somewhere? Somewhere not too far from, from good old Walt's America. This is what a, a high, very high end, I would think, natural rain system looks like. This is where Mother Nature wants to go and properly managed and left alone if we're not out there trying to always kill the things we don't want. Like. A lot of diversity out there. We've seen this slide earlier today, and I'm just going to kind of breeze right through it because when we did this thing in Burlington, we had two different shows, and we kind of got to cap the audience here, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. Tim's already been on most of the most of the highlights there, but again, high disturbance over there, annual plants, low disturbance up there, a lot of big woody plants, high diversity, low diversity. And hopefully if I get this thing to click. Bacterial driven system over here, fungal system over here, and in the middle here, probably where we need to be most of the time. Natural flow of energy. Think about where nature wants to go, just like our, our pasture system that we saw just a little bit ago over here by Johnson. That's where nature wants to go. She wants to have lots of different plants, cool season plants, warm season plants, woody plants, plants that go up and make a seed grow quick. Perennial, it's dominated by a perennial system. And farming, essentially, what we try to do is take human inputs, take oil and machinery and energy and ideas and chemicals push back against Mother Nature where she really wants to go. All the rest you consider what Mother Nature wants to do, no matter where you're at, this is going to work. <coughs> they slipped a new slide in on me. We'll get through this. Some of this stuff we're going to see here in a little bit is coming to us from North Dakota. Heat stuff going on up here. This first deal is from North Carolina. This gentleman I can't remember his name right now. He went up to Bismarck, went to a presentation. He did what we call the Kool-Aid. He said, man, this tape is the coolest thing ever. I'm going to go plant me some cover crops. So this is him in May about 2008, I believe it is. He's standing in a field the next spring after he plants his cool season mix. Believe it or not, there's six or seven species there. You can't really tell if it's dog in primary by the steel rod. And he's getting ready to plant corn. What do you think he's thinking right now? It's a joke out there, right? That's what he has to think, right? Houston, we have a problem. Houston, we've got an uh, opportunity. That's what it is. An opportunity. Believe it or not, this kind of forced him into coming up something. How are we going to do this? The guy to think. Here's what they came up with. Gotta get that thing smacked down to the ground, to roll it down. They sprayed it with, I think it was about 16 ounces of glyphosate. Essentially what they think is about 95% of this, this rye, I think there's some, some kind of mustard in there. Uh, I can see a little yellow plant down in there. Like I said, there's six or seven species. But they roll that stuff down, and when that breaks it over, essentially it all but kills it. But they, they wanted to make sure they didn't have any plant survive. So they went ahead and sprayed it with glyphosate when they were done. And this is him getting ready to plant. It still looks like a mess to me if you're ever going to go through. Uh, all this mad land here on the ground, it's like pretty best left. But here's what he did. I think a big part of the reason why this thing worked as well as it did is right after they got it rolling that down, they had some good sharp blades on that planter. They were able to cut through that stuff before it leaked fire. Got a little slot through there and planted the corn. Anybody think they're going to get corn on this still? Anybody think they're not going to get corn on this still? What rainfall is in North Carolina or wherever this is? That's the difference so right here. Do you know the answer to that, Ed? Excuse me? 42 inches? 42 inches. And I, think, <laughs> I think in this particular time, they were they were in graphing situations. I think they were about 24, 26 inches of rainfall. It, it's it's more than that. That's the graph. <laughs> the, point of the, the point of the slide is not that, not that we're going to do exactly what they're going to do here. The point of the slide is 
if you set your mind to do something, there's a way to accomplish it. So, so try to take try to take the right message here. You know, what would look like an insurmountable problem all of a sudden becomes a very manageable situation. When I was over in July last week, they talked to some guys, and they were kind of cow guys. They were over there for the conference, and anyway, they didn't, I don't want to talk about cover crops. They said, well, what do you think about that? They said, boy, I don't know if we're going to grow that thing. I said, well, how much rain do you get at your farm? Oh, 26 to 30 inches. See, he was thinking the same thing here that they could get. It rainfall the same as other guys. He said, well, I don't know. It's too high up here. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, hold on, this ain't falling in. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things, we had a real neat slide. It's from the same area. It's from North Carolina. I wish I got to have my presentation now. But essentially, they had some, some droughty conditions there. I believe this was two years ago. And the corn was looking pretty tough. But they had the same exact kind of deal. They had the rye down between the rows. And they stood side to side. The rye between the rows just like this. And one's without between the rows. The other one looked like gunnings. The one in the rye actually still looked good. So it's all relevant. In fact, what's that comment you said, Tim, about the guy in the flood hills? They're two weeks away from a, from a drought or three weeks away from a drought. They have to stop rain. So everybody's got their own challenge. To answer the question, now yeah, we got more on this deal. In fact, I was looking at uh, Keith Burns' paperwork I gave you this morning, Ed. Uh, he's got a real neat picture just like that, too. Essentially, what they're trying to do is slice through there, disturb as little as possible, make as much cover as possible. We had a producer not too far from here do the same kind of similar thing. Simply when he's planting his milo, they had the row cleaners on the front, planting on 30 inch rows. He realized how much it's going to disturb it, how much it's raking that residue back in this plant. So right in the middle of the field, they stopped and took off the row cleaners. Took the tea post and drove right on the spot. Went ahead and planted the rest of the milo. This stuff's all planted the same week. Took me by there one day and he said, What do you think's gonna happen here? He said, What's this? All of a sudden, boom. He said, Well, I cut that. He said, I'm gonna pay attention. He said, I'm telling you, there's more mile on the other side. The only thing he did is took off the road cleaners, sliced through that deal, so clean off the spot this big and went this big. 30 bushel an acre difference on mile. It's 50 bushel an acre right up to the line where he drove that post, and 80 bushel right on the other side. Same gear, same guy. The only difference is a little narrow slot. Yeah. If you remember in Tim's presentation, the work that was done right across the line over here in Kansas with 100% residue, do you think that's 100% residue on the field? Okay. How much more? How much more moisture would you have in that field for that corn crop if that's 100% residue in inches? Anybody remember? Three inches. Three to four inches. So three to four inches. If, if we're in a 14-inch rainfall area and we can, in essence, save four inches, three to four inches of moisture, that puts us in a 17-inch rainfall area or the equivalent thereof. So you have, to, you have to see things differently. You have to start to look at things in a different way than we've ever looked at them before. Uh, Kevin, the you knew, you knew the Anderson when he was in the background. Yeah. He was the guy we were talking about a while ago. <coughs> and we saw his presentation up in Burlington. They looked at on those field peas, planting them for a cover crop. And they were looking at, I mean, they were measuring the soil moisture. And they said up to about four to six weeks before the before those peas flowered. He said basically you can either have it evaporate or you can have it run through peas. It's all the same. After it flowers, then you start getting that drain on, a net drain on soil moisture. But if you get that up and you get it covered, and now you're saving what gets in there afterwards, you'd still be better off. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> There's a plan on the plan. If, if you're using that moisture and you have a plant right up to the time you're going to plant, you're going to plant right up to that time. You've got plants out there growing, and you've already used up that moisture there, and now you're going to plant whatever it is, corn, whatever, you're going to put it out there, and there's no moisture because you've already used it up. It's already used up. But and you're going to plant it there and say, well, everything's going to be great. It's not going to be great. I can tell you what's going to happen. It's not even going to come up. But it's too dry. 
I just, you've already used the moisture. What are you going to do? I've used the moisture. It's gone. It's not going to come until it falls from the rain again. It's gone. It's not going to come up. It won't come up. It's dry. It used to come from the pepper crop. It's gone. Uh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> it is gone. I just noticed it. It's gone. You problem, used it up. But the problem is, you're making more place in the sun. You don't have it growing right until the time you plant. That's you have you have one of the tenths of the thing is that you have a, a living root out there all the time. That means that you don't terminate beforehand, you terminate on the day you plant. Is that right? That is not correct. Well, how do you get the root living roots out there all the time? Well, what we're saying is you keep it covered all the time. No, no. One of the tenets is, is a living root out there all the time. That's one of the right. tenets. Right? Is that right? Isn't it right? <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up. For two reasons. I want to get back to Don had an issue a little bit ago. We're going to talk about the four principles that are all being illustrated in this picture, but to follow up on your point, I mean, I observed this on my own little piece of dirt in 2010. Five days before we planted the corn, we sprayed the volunteer wheat. The volunteer wheat grew right up until the time within five days, very similar to this right here. Fabulous corn crop on a dry and field. Even back I, I can show you a time where I had millet in this field. Millet no, was just a use of a lot of moisture. I tried to plant wheat right back in there and made, what, six tenths of a bushel, whereas I had the fallow period in there and it made 30 bushel. That's the difference between making money and not making money. Let me ask you this. I think it's a good question. One of the guys, you're going to see some data on here pretty quick. He's doing, they did millet behind wheat. Up and up around the line. They've been doing it for a long time. He's figured out in that in that system, he's actually making most of his money off the millet. As it works out. He's making lots of money off the millet. And what he's gonna do now, he's actually flip flop the deal around. Instead of planting the millet after the wheat like they used to, they're gonna put the millet in front of the wheat right now. They're gonna grow the millet crop, come in there, spray it, take it off, and they're gonna plant wheat. There's some neat things going on here. I think it'd be something up to look at. What do you mean by taking it off? Harvest it. Harvest it. I mean, cut it. Pro-soil Okay. Harvest it for grain. Yeah. Okay. Leave the stalks down. Now, if we had this crop in back county, we'd think cash crop and then corn crop. I'm with Kevin. But if we if we roll down a green crop, a like green manure crop like that in the back county, it'd be the best condition we could ever get. And then, and, and, and I, I, I agree with him a lot of things, but I guess I need to, I got, I've got the concept of the two dimes, too. We probably need to do a little bit of change in there. Okay, very but good. he does it all the time. He's a pro at it. Jeff. Um, <coughs> all right, so I, I'm the range comment. This is the first time I've seen this presentation too, so I'm a little confused here. Um, you say you can save four inches of moisture in the soil and it's covered completely, right? That's what we're saying. How many inches of moisture does it take to raise a crop? I'm glad you asked. You're 10 slides away from that answer. Okay, how many inches of moisture does it take to raise the cover crop? We're working on that too, about okay. 14 slides from that. <laughs> that's a good question though, because that's the question we're going to try to answer, so thanks for bringing that up. Okay. Well, I'll just say this. Well, Wes Robbins told us 12 years ago, he said, you guys are growing the crops on what falls on the crop. He said, you guys think you're, you're putting the your bank and moisture and stuff. And some of that's true, because we do that. We bank moisture. But if what Wes is telling us, I mean, he, I don't know what his percentage was. He said, you know, most of the bushels growing are what falls on the crop while it's growing. And he tells you, you can't save the moisture in the soil. You can for a short period of time. He's argued that. I, but, we can't do this in back County. If you grew that much, but you might grow this much and kill it. But then you're, we do that. You like weeds. Yeah. It's, it's like weeds, so it's like uh, cheap grass. If I have a little bit of cheap grass in my irrigated cornfield, it grows that fall and seeds out. I don't get a stand, even though I spray it and kill it, and spray it top two by two. Even watering it up, you can't get a stand. But, I believe there's something to this, but there's a lot of confusion here, you know, I mean, 
Um, that's what's causing all this. No, I, I think it's all good questions. I mean, I haven't heard a bad question yet. Yeah. Well, if if we have the slide on there that says we want to be able to have a live read in the soil 100% of the time, that's an error. That's an error. That's all right. I, I try to exercise editorial authority, but every once in a while something slips by me. The point, the point of it is the point is that we want to have a live root in the soil as long as we can most of the time to promote soil health. Now we can't always do that. If we're growing a corn crop, for instance, we plant that corn crop fairly early in the spring, we're going to harvest that fairly late in the fall, we may not have an opportunity to do anything in the way of any cover crop or anything with that corn crop. But we still got a corn crop, we got live roots in the soil for a large percentage of the year. If, if we have wheat crops, for instance, we have a live root in the soil for a less period of time. Perhaps there's some ways we can work some cover crops or some other things into that system to help promote the soil health. We don't know, Baca County is a very different animal than, than most any place this is being used. Absolutely. But it's not, uh, as I said long ago when we were doing a rainfall simulator, they're doing this in eastern Montana on 10 inches. They have less panabap, there's no doubt about that. So, you know, they get more of their 10 inches perhaps than we do. But we think there are ways, and we're fixing to get into that with, with the rest of Soren's presentation, we think there are ways to manage the moisture that we get much better than we have. I agree with that. Sure. And, and because of that management of moisture, we may be able to do more with our crops than we ever thought we could. And if, if, as we have seen in many of the places that we visited and many of the stuff we've seen, the collaboration between the different species all in one time make for some kind of amazing things to happen, we may do a lot more with that on less moisture than you would ever think we could. And what we have to do is we have to work with it here in this area. And we have to try things and we have to experiment with it to see what we can accomplish. And, and Kevin brought up a really good point. There is this fallow inefficiency. You know, about as much as you can get out of a fallow period is about 25% of the moisture that falls. The rest of us lost. So we can work on that fallow. And, and we can grow some, some, some plants. For yes, I agree. One, one more thing to jump in here on this particular, I, and I read this the other day, I talked to a very interesting gentleman from Alliance Nebraska, and he talked about the fallow, the moisture savings during the warm growing season is horribly inefficient. Yes. 10% maybe. Now, where you're gaining, if you've got that, that dry, warm fallow period and you have to get some snow, kind of like we got here, now we can make a little bit of moisture if we get to get some of this moisture like you guys have been getting. But no, when they're talking fallow, they're talking about the, we're talk, talking about the summer fallow. And that, that's yeah, why I'm that's where it's, yeah. not, it's not very efficient there. It's, it's not actually, very efficient. Yeah, it's not very efficient. In fact, the first thing I saw of this was the mayor estimate is done down in Dalhar in the late 60s. And it blew my mind. They showed they could save an inch and 35 hundredths of moisture by doing the fallow period. And then they showed me the rainfall records. They got an inch 35 hundredths in July, right before they planted the wheat. So it told me right then and there, the whole thing was BS. And so what did I do? I threw the bullshit I mean, the, I mean the bullet sauce plant. <laughs> because it, it made no sense at all. They were trying to say, yeah, this fallow is a good thing. It's a wonderful thing. But the reality was, the moisture toward the soil in that summer wasn't very good. In fact, the moisture apparently just fell from the sky a few weeks before they completed the, the test. The purpose of this slide here, and I think this has been a good discussion, we're going to move on here. The purpose of this slide right here was to basically say, do we have all four principles at work? Okay? Soil covered at all times? Okay? <coughs> Diversity of species? Warm season? Cool season? No till to establish the crop. <coughs> Anybody got another principle out there? Every second is just got a filler. Live root. Good <laughs> 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 <Yeah, look. laughs> As close as possible, that's essentially what's happened here. We basically went from a live root to soil, and for all practical purposes, we turned right away on the smack, smack the old thing, put the new thing in there. That's essentially what we're seeing for a here. One more example of this, we went up to Birdie County. Uh, they're in about the 16 inch rainfall area. They have about, we think about half the panty map you have here in Walsh. So, I mean, it's a different climate. 
Same way there at Pierre, South Dakota. I mean, it's a 16-inch rainfall area. We saw some really neat stuff along there, but it's not complete yet. What did you say the rainfall was here in Canada? Actually, it was 19. Oh, 19. So it's actually better than up there. Yeah. Nine by three. Okay. All right. So over the last 30 years, I got things. Things was a wet year, wet decade. So remember that. <laughs> This guy I talked to earlier today at North Central Campus, he had rainfall records from like 1895. It's kind of amazing. There really wasn't that much difference. In fact, even the 30s, it wasn't that terrible there. I mean, they were getting somewhere around 21 inches on average down there. And he's having the same exact questions you're having up there with half panty bat and more rainfall. And he's looking the same exact question you guys are having. This is essentially a demonstration farm. The conservation district in Burley County bought this farm. It was a conventionally managed farm prior to them taking over. They wanted to sit down and start actually demonstrating some of the things that we've been talking about here tonight to see, hey, I think this is pretty cool and can we make it work and what can we show people? Essentially here, now they laid out the farm. If you look closely here, there's essentially livestock tanks across there. And so part of the thing they're trying to do here, they want to be able to incorporate livestock or add that other species to the system to figure out ways to harvest those crops, increase that nutrient cycling, and maybe do things with a little less of the store-bought input. First year they took over the farm, this is September of 09, no commercial fertilizer, they went out there and they put together one of these old cattle crop mixes, seeded it, September 20th, jump in, Kelly. What does, what does a cover crop mix like that cost? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Anywhere from, oh gosh, I saw some things in Salina the day, it was like 12 bucks, but all the way up to 40 bucks. Keep that number in mind. In fact, I, I looked at one to say, to say if it was just a, it was a big mix, just looking at one. And one of them was, uh, uh, what's the one? Airy Veg. Mm -hmm. And that's a real, real, real big one to use. One of the sources I had, it cost like uh, $4 a pound for that set. You had 40 pounds. That's 160 bucks. That'd be crazy. Oh. <laughs> well, but you plant that in a mix. So you yeah, know, but it'd be hard. Well, the cow peas on there, they, they cost money. All, all these things cost money. It's, I'm the cow crop is a, a lot more. It's a lot more than twelve bucks there. I guarantee that's more than twelve bucks. Than that that mix right sure. there would probably yeah. be somewhere in thirty-five to forty. Yeah, that's closer. I'll go ahead. Have you looked at but, this though? What? I'm just sitting here looking at what's in there. There's really nothing in here that costs a whole bunch of money in this mix. Five six dollars for the beans right there. Okay. So if you just buy the top, that's just all right there. Uh, no, I'm just saying. Even the sweet clover costs. Three bucks. Three bucks. Three bucks. Okay. Three bucks. How much are you selling? How much are you selling? Twelve bucks a bushel. Tell me. Tell me. Tell me how much those fifteen pound soybeans are. One of the things I'll tell you guys right now, there's a, there's a producer here in the county, he started looking around what he just had in his grain bin. He figured out half the crops that he didn't want to plant his mint. He's already owns the crop. You know, we don't grow a lot of radishes around here. He's got to go find that guy in the turnips and stuff, cow peas. There's a few things you have to go buy. A lot of this stuff, we actually grow right here. It's the stuff that we already grow and we know how to grow. What's interesting about this, keep that number in mind, Kevin, though, about what it costs to put this in. I think it's going to be very interesting here in this morning. I'm glad you did on that. So long. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 35 or 40 bucks. Okay, 35 or 40 bucks. Hang on to that number. Okay, I will. Hang on to that number. Here's the next spring. They go out there, essentially, they're, they're planting through that mix. Everything's just kind of standing dead like it was. And they, they basically frost terminated that track. There was no, no, no chemical to terminate this cover crop. Another way you can kind of save a little bit on this. Here's the results. You might explain what compost tea is. I think everybody understands what compost tea is. <laughs> I'm not sure I agree what compost tea is. Would you ask for really cool stuff. Essentially, essentially what they do is it's just like what you think it would be. They take compost material, stuff they've composted in a pile, and they brew tea, essentially, and make a tea with it. They've got a little place similar to your shop out there, and they run the hot water through it, and they, they make a batch of tea. And what they're able to do, the tea is extracting the microorganisms out of the compost, and so you can actually take and get them over a lot more acres than you could if you were just putting compost out there by itself. You can put it in your, you know, put it in your uh, sprayer and, and go spray it. This pile he had up there, it was probably, I don't know how long it was, 50 yards long, whatever it was, a little pile of compost about that high. And he said, if I go put that compost on a wheat field right now, he said, I can do about 70 acres. 
that compost right there. I can treat about 70 acres, but if I'm making it a compost tea, I can spray every acre in the county. Exponentially, he could, because the way it mines that out, he can take those microbes and get them out over a lot bigger area than he could just by using the compost, so it's an increase in efficiency. We're going to see a little bit about what the buses are. These obviously look like pretty good yields. To me, the most amazing thing about this whole thing is here is they took over a conventionally managed farm, no commercial fertilizer. They started implementing some of the things we're talking about here in this deal. Get a pretty good crop that first year. Notice what's going on here in the middle. Live <laughs> <laughs> Here's, 
one thing to add, I don't have the slide for presentation, but this guy that happens to be the, the president of the Conservation District Board up there, he's doing the same thing. His cost reduction on corn in 2009 was $1.50 bushel. So get your pencils out. $1.50 bushel. Pays 100 bushel corn. You make it any money? And, and it's pretty easy to say, well, yeah, but how's he figuring his cost of production? I spent 30 years in the banking business. I've looked at the figures. He's, he's looking at his land costs, his overhead costs. He's looking at pretty much everything. Oh, sure. The one thing I noticed on this that wouldn't work for me is he increased the over-the-county average 30%. If I go 30% over my county average, I shouldn't plant corn. Mm -hmm. Because 30 bushel corn don't do much. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you at? Kyle Carey. Kyle, what, what's your name, by the way? Wayne Stubbs. Wayne, glad to meet you. I've, I've heard some things about the Stubbs since I was just saying with that. That's it. Good thing is, good thing. Good thing is, one of our local guys was talking about all the wonderful things the Stubbs are doing up for you. This doesn't mean like you guys can heal the sick and raise the dead up there on this thing. Come on. So where we're shooting for a whole lot more than 30 percent. Okay, are you guys primarily is it wheat, millet? What else? Well, we're mixing some stuff in. We're here listening. Okay. Hey, I'll, I'll clear this up. This is the first story I ever heard about, and it was Lindley. Is that your father? Okay, very good. The, 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 the millet wheat thing, how many crops are you getting in how many years? Uh, up there where, where corn's not buying? Well, we, we have been doing that particular rotation very long, in about four years. Five or five years. And uh, the basic thing there is just to keep something growing up there. While we're, while we're getting, but we're trying to grow something that we can take to the bank. Sure. And, and the cover crop thing, uh, I'm thinking about this, but I'm thinking I got to take it to the bank. Yeah. You know, if, if I want to use that moisture, I got to convert it. I think this is where this comes back a little bit to the livestock thing a little bit. We're standing out there in this gentleman's field who's got the corn at the break even of a buck fifty a bushel. We're standing out there, you know, chattering, watching. He's standing there with his cover crop up to here, and so the question came up: What are you going to do with this? He goes, I don't know. I'm going to build it up. Might raise it, might not. What the hell? I mean, you just got through throwing 30 bucks out here. Come on. You're going to have to get something off of it. If you're going to raise it, at least we've got a way to get the money back and get, get the cash back out of it. This guy is such a forward thinker on this deal, though. He's not just looking at this, the next little deal. He's looking at the whole system five years down the road. They're making lots of money. In fact, he mentioned the other day, they turned a section of ground, rent the ground back. He goes, we're making all the money we need to make. We've only got so much time. I want to focus on my family. I'm having a good time here making plenty of money. Get that section of the ground back to somebody else. Let some young guy take over. This guy's kind of an outside the box kind of guy. But I think it's good. I'm actually really glad you guys are here because I've been hearing about you guys trying some things that seem to be outside of what's conventionally known to be true here on the Eastern Plains. I like to work with you a little more. Anybody else know what, Tim? Kevin brought up something. <coughs> And I, maybe I misunderstood his statement, but he said, you know, you can't do this one year, you know, you can't make And I think that is a really important thing is this is going to take some time. I mean, it, and if any of you have ever seen somebody with a recovering alcohol, when they first get off the jet, life is not good for them. You're looking at, you've got to change an entire ecosystem over from one from one environment to another. That don't just happen like that. And so you're gonna you're gonna have now, there, there's a learning curve for you and there's a learning curve for all that stuff that's down there below the ground. And they've got to get switched over to. And then if you may, if you screw something up, in the meantime, you can that much for a time. Op optimum conditions, how many years do you think that would take? May I answer that one? I just got off the phone this morning with a gentleman in North Dakota, uh, Western North Dakota by the name of John Stickett. And what, I asked him those exact questions. 
And he said, if you've got somebody who's been no-tilling, doing a good job of no-tilling, we were going to do a t-shirt that I ran out of time. It says, no-till. What part of no don't you understand? Because when we say no-till, we mean no-till. But if you've been doing a good job of no-tilling for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, you're going to see results according to John the first year. You're going to see things happening by using the, by going to the full cell full soil health thing the first year. If you've been conventional tilling, he said you've got the same setback on going from conventional to no-till as you would have anyway. And he said what happens there is it takes about three years from the time you start down this path with no whether you do it with no-till, what I call conventional no-till, or whether you go no-till soil health, you've got about a three-year period of time. In that three-year period of time, you're going to suffer 10 to 15 percent yield reductions or you're going to have to add about 10 to 15 percent more nitrogen to the mix because the reason you're suffering the yield reductions is as the micro, microbial and the other animals in the soil start to, to build up their numbers, they take nitrogen to accomplish that. So you can put a little additional nitrogen in the system and probably get the same yields. But you're either going to have less yields or you're going to have a little more expense for about three years. One more, then we're going to keep going. Yeah, that, that's no different from when we started strip tilling and irrigating surface. Okay, I mean, everybody said, no, you can't do that, you can't do that. You just can't strip till back in the corn stalks and plant the next year. And the first year we did it, we got through it surprisingly easy. The second year, it was harder to get through that trash. The third year was even harder. Some guys quit. Some guys started burning it off. But once you got to that fourth year, you started seeing all these earthworms, and amazingly enough, you start to get through that trash better and better every year. Now it's easy. Everybody does it. But, you know, it took, and we still have the same issues with that. We had nitrogen tie-ups. We had yellow corns coming out of the ground. Everybody driving by laughing and going, look at that. So that's not working. But, you know, everybody does it now. So it's just a, it's a process you got to get to. And we're way better off than we were. Yeah. I, and for you, where you've been no-dealing all this time, you're, you're not going to have as much of a learning curve with it. The big learning curve we have in doing something with somebody who's no tilling is figuring out exactly what species of cover crops we want to use in order to achieve the desired result. And that's going to be, there's going to be a considerable number of mistakes made on that. But that, I mean, I told you I'm not a crop guy, I'm a range What I have seen on rangeland what will happen is you'll, you'll change things that are, you'll go, and Steve, you can speak to this too. Generally, you're going to be at least two years where you're sitting there going, I don't see any better. My place looks just like the neighbor's does right now. And then you'll make a big jump, and then it'll rock along, and you're going to say, you know, it just ain't doing any good anymore. And things have got to build, and you've got to get, and I don't know what all it's got. Sometimes it's covered, sometimes it is, you've got to have a germination event, sometimes it is a uh, particularly wet year, sometimes it is you got to kill what's there in the first place. And then all of a sudden you'll see another little job. And so it's not a, you don't, you don't figure, well, it's just going to get a little better every year. You're going to probably have nothing happen, and then you move to a new place. We're going to keep, we're going to keep moving here, guys. You don't mind. I really hate to cut it off because I know there's a good give and take here. But we've got some other stuff, particularly about what's happening in Eastern Colorado with the moisture and the cover crop. I want to make sure we get to before we all fall asleep, which is what we're getting here. Where are we going to get the money to grow the crop? We don't have enough to build crash crop. That's exactly what we're talking about, okay? And here's some of the reasons why we think there's something good going on here. Because we're, we're addressing the four principles, okay? So what's happened here? This kind of falls up to Tim. We're in a D4 drought. This is right north of Springfield right now, middle of June. Why is the grass going here? <laughs> Somebody told me. 
Somebody took one look at this thing and they said, well, it rained more on that side of the pickup. <laughs> it rained there, right? What it looked like on the other side? I'm like, no, I don't know. Let's go look. That yeah, is the south side, right? That's the north side. Here's the south side. There's the south side. That's what rains. If you don't believe it didn't rain more, see how much cleaner the pickup is right <laughs> Anyway, full sun. A little more rain, maybe. There's a little tougher green. You can't already see it. There's not much going on over here. Okay? Get back to the shady thing a little bit. Seen this slide before, right? Can you have presentation over here where we got something green and growing, got a little shade management going on. It's about 20 degrees difference here. Actually, on the soil surface, if you just look at what's going on right at the surface, it's actually no more dramatic than this in some cases. We saw a deal from the guy, uh, the guy from the Paris over there the other day. They had some 160 degree temperatures on the soil surface there in the absence of residue. I think 104 degrees is when it starts smoking the little microbes down here. So over 107 degrees Fahrenheit, we'll probably start to cook the little boogers and they're going out of the system. So that's why it's important to keep it covered. Again, we run back up to North Dakota. We talked a little bit earlier about monocultures versus polycultures. Essentially, these crops are planted at the same time. Everybody's been kind of complaining about, well, you know, we don't get that kind of moisture here. Essentially, what was happening up here for that year, three inches of moisture for the year, one inch from the time this thing was planted to the time we took this picture. And I think this picture is in late July, early August, July 20th. The turnips over here in the, poly, in, the, in the monoculture is basically dead for all practical purposes. Over here, we got the eight-way mix, same exact rainfall area. You think there's more stuff going on over here than here? These things are better. 50 feet apart, maybe. I mean, these are side by side shots, so you can't see because we've got the pictures here. So, what's the difference here? It's about a four fold increase in the biomass above the surface here of this cocktail mix where we've got some clarity things going on. Same exact rainfall, same exact farmer. This also happens to be the guy's farm where he does the $1.50 fifty bushel corn break even deal. So, oh, July 31st, I was thinking it's the 20th. But no, really, where do we get the water from? Remember, we don't, it doesn't rain here, darn it. We just got to be going through this big old massive drought. Here's another little look. Tim had a similar deal on the water cycle. This is some stuff that came to us from Oklahoma State University where they started looking. What they were really trying to figure out is, is don't we have enough water? I think we could double crop here. I mean, we get enough water down here, you know, east of I-35. We could probably double crop. So let's try to quantify how much more we get and where it goes. And essentially what they did, here's the water that falls. The stuff that's down here is the blue water, the stuff that either runs off or infiltrates. The green water is the stuff that actually makes it to the root zone and sucks up the process by the plants. The white water over here is the stuff that simply evaporates off the soil surface, having never made it down in there and never went through the plant. Pretty striking here what happens here. It's kind of really a glaring, the obvious issue with uh, the efficiencies of what's going on. This is what's happening here. And this is about a 35 inch rainfall area down in still water. 34 inches, there we go. Blue water, this is stuff that uh, runs off or percolates down to the uh, aquifer. It's pretty darn high. We don't have that going on here. In fact, this is about what we got here at the year here. Green water is what actually the plants take up. And I think there's some neat things going on here uh, with practically everything. A lot of times we don't really quantify how much the plant actually needs to grow and complete its life cycle. It's not as so much as you think. What they found here, though, is the biggest portion of the water there simply leaving that system because the plants never had, had access to it. It simply came down and bowled right back out of the system. So out of 34 inches, 18.5 is leaving that system without, without being used by the plants. So the question we've asked, and this is the question you need to ask yourself, can we shift a portion of the water from the white water, that's the water that just is going back up and not being processed by the plants, back into green water, which is the water that the plants will use through something we think about biological intensification adding more crop species to the mix and maybe taking a look at cover crops. So we think the answer is yes on this. You guys might take a look at this. To me, this is kind of a neat deal. We've seen some other data from Akron and some other places here. We kind of looked at this about what the crop actually takes to grow. If you simply isolate all those variables that we just illustrated here about what a crop actually takes to grow. This is kind of interesting to me here. 90 bushel of corn, 8.7 inches of moisture to grow that thing. We always think about grain sorghum being so much more efficient, but look at this, 45 bushel of sorghum, 5.8. That almost tells me that maybe corn's been getting a bad rap because we're growing twice as much corn, but it's not taking twice as much water. 
Other kind of neat thing here, look at these guys down here. They're not really taking that much moisture. Wheat. Most of the wheat grown in this country, look at that, that yield right there. I mean, that's the kind of yield we can grow right around here. But what the plants actually use them is 6.2 inches. We threw this up here. Tim pointed out we got some fuzzy math going on here every day. We didn't actually stop and check this. But we finally found some data in a U.S. geological survey deal for eastern Colorado. And, and basically what it was talking about is the blue water. I always said it was less than an inch. We used to have this an inch. It's a fraction of an inch. It actually runs off or percolates into aquifers almost nil. So in 14 inch rainfall area, once you realize very little of it's blue water, Essentially, you've got this much for green water, like our wheat example. This is what bile would take. And this is what's leaving the system that's not ever getting a chance to be utilized by the plant. Can you give me the last slide back up again? Sure. <coughs> this is, this though, this from Oklahoma. The ones that, the numbers I've seen from uh, up in Akron. Yes. Uh, it's, it's like, it takes about, for winter wheat, it was like that six, 0.5 or whatever it is for to get to the to get to the green phase, get to the get to the, uh, basically where every inch thereafter you you get yield, and so that's just like the, the basis to get you to the point of yield uh, according to uh, Akron's numbers. But is, that, is that just transverse? It takes no, it takes six. They said it's like six. six but I remember six and a half inches of water to get to where the first bushel. Every, every inch thereafter gives you bushels. So th these numbers are much different than I've seen before. Did your numbers take any transfer transpiration? No, these are this yeah, that, they would be the same but it's transpiration. Yep. But it takes it takes that much just to get you to where you get a yield, start start to make a yield. And then every inch you get beyond that point. Then that actually yield about about seven bushels per inch, basically. To help with the, to help with this a little bit, there's an individual in uh, by Fort Collins who works for ARS. His name is Tom Trout. Have you ever visited yep. Tom? Uh -huh. Tom's doing some work up there on transpiration right now with the help of some sort of little magic box or device that's actually measuring how much water is going through the uh, just the plant. The plant. Right. And so it would be just the transpiration. And on 125 bushels of corn last year, he measured it at 10 inches. So that would be very similar to the to the information that we have here. I, 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 go go look at the numbers from Akron because they uh, uh, Nielsen does a great job. And uh, I've actually looked at our numbers that I've had for 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 water use, and they've been really close to his numbers. So I'm going to say his numbers are really close. To Keep in mind that we're trying to separate the wheat from the shaft here. We're trying to figure out how much we get, how much we use, and how much we're losing in the system. But yeah. I, I, think, I think that's the point we're trying to make. And this gives me a good point. I think it's a good question. Here's a little cheat sheet map we got from that survey showing that basically about, about two tenths of an inch is actually what's running off for it. And that's, and that's a big portion we can call out of there. We think, it, we think it's pretty true from where we live. In fact, even over here uh, in this adjacent area, it's, uh, it's actually slightly more, I believe. But anyway, for, for all practical purposes, eastern Colorado, half inch will knock it dead. One little place right up here is actually between a half inch and an inch. 90% of it, not all that much. Again, we're going to jump back up to North Dakota and one of the side to side deals. They want to measure, okay, so how much does this cocktail actually take? What's really the net effect of planting the cocktail versus doing a chem battle deal like what we've always done and what we think we need to be doing? One side of it was, uh, was peas that were sprayed twice with herbicide control the weeds until the next crop, and corn's going to be the next crop. The other one, they planted a diverse mix in there. They wanted to check the water. Where are we having to begin? We're going to check the moisture in the soil. Okay? So we get our fine folks from NRCS out there. We get the probe truck out, measure what's in the soil. This is where we're starting. Figured out what the capacity of that soil was. We're going to have much water there. Then we do our treatments. Okay? Here's what the data showed. And essentially what they did, they measured from the time they started, and then they measured right up to when they're getting ready to plant the corn crop next May. And that data there, that particular example showed there was essentially no difference between where they grew the cover crop and where they did no cover crop in the chem pile. Okay, one example, sound size of one. And this is water holding capacity of the soil. So we thought, well, this is kind of interesting, kind of cool. So we thought, 
wonder if we could do this down here in eastern Colorado because what they do in North Dakota is something different from what they're going to do down here, right? So we went up north. This is up uh, a little bit south by 70. 23 bushel strip of straw over here. Right here next to it, and this is a site of a site comparison. They jumped in there and planted uh, August. When did they do this? August 12th, 14th? 12th, I think. Essentially, what he did, and thinking a little bit about what Kevin talked talk about the other day, they waited on the rain. It just so happens there, uh, first week of August, they caught about a two inch rain. It actually been fairly dry out there. It very much surprised me. I thought they were getting all the rain. It looked like every cloud in the world was going up there. But they ended up with, on this side, about seven inches of total moisture for the year. It's what they ended up with. I mean, it was very comparable to what we had down here. I was quite surprised. One of the things you'll notice here, we talk about keep it covered at all times. Look at all that bare soil in there. I mean, this is 23 bushel strippers straw. It's not killer. But my guess is we're leaking water out of that system. As long as that's open and that deal there, we have a single species in there that happens to be dead right now. We don't have live roots over here. Over here, we took these pictures. We, what are we out there? October-ish, about 10 days after freeze. I mean, we still got some great stuff going on out here on this side here. Brassicas. This is like a six or seven way mix out there. He did mix some millet in there. A big portion of what's on this thing is, is some millet they just had lying around. I thought, well, we want to get some more visit out there, so let's get some more millet out there. I don't think he had any brassicas on this particular one here. Your memory's better than mine. I saw, I saw a turn this long when I was up there. Well, but that was not on this field. That was, oh, on, okay. that was on Blades Field. He had, he had a mix of flax, oats, millet, uh, grain sorghum, Ethiopian cabbage, I think the north is What about the sapphire? Sapphire. Sapphire was the other mix. Anyway, six or seven way cocktail mix here. Again, we're talking about a seven inch rainfall area. This was planted behind a two inch rain. So, anyway, we thought, well, let's look at another chance. Another DC called the same thing. You may have seen this picture before. This is a, that same slide I think Tim was showing in his presentation. Failed wheat over here. This is up by Simla. Essentially, what they did is they said, well, we've got this little 35 acre patch. Planted some cover crops over here. This is the chem file over here. This thing was sprayed like four times, I believe it was. I'm very interested to see that. That's <coughs> what all they did to control and suppress. Kind of like the, what, who was it that said that in Salina? Remember the thing is? Colin Zayas. We, we try to take the plants that naturally want to grow here and we kill them and replace them with plants that naturally want to die. We did a whole lot of killing out there. So anyway, one other interesting thing here, I wasn't on this, but when they went to do the moisture monitoring, just like they did in North Dakota, they had to walk about 100 yards out here in this cover crop field because the first 100 yards is blown full of snow. Might be something going on here. From, from the other part of the field. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So basically what they're trying to do here is trying to duplicate the efforts of what they did in North Dakota, employ the IRS to get involved in this deal to help us measure that soil moisture at the top three feet of soil. We got the soil struck out of Pueblo, I believe it was. We took the cores. You took four cores on each side in the cover crop and in the cover crop. On the control valley. and the cover crop. Okay. It's, it's still. What we're going to do, this was taken as close as we could after, after that. Were you in November then? When would you do that? Yeah, it was in November. There was some snow on the ground. There wasn't any snow on the ground when we did when we did the one in Hugo. By the time we got up to Simla, which was a couple of weeks later, it had snowed, but none of it had melted yet. So basically, what we were trying to do was get the soil moisture prior to any melt in. Okay. Moving right along. Essentially, this is what the, what the data showed. This is what came back from from ARS. It showed that this is what it took to grow that cover crop in effect. Is that correct, Dad? No, that is the remaining moisture, oh. 1.74 oh, inches of go. remaining moisture under the cover crop. The fallow, and that was a Hugo, had 